Welcome everybody to yet another live interview with Become a Fearless Father. And today I am blessed to have Michael Laur Lauria with me. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Close enough. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thanks, I appreciate that. So <laughs> we're going to talk about tons of stuff. We're definitely going to be talking about your book because that sounds very interesting, very exciting and very insightful as well. So we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about tons of stuff. First of all, for all the people, as you guys know, I'm always trying to look. Here's the link. The link is also in the comments section. So make sure you check it out. I'll show this for a little bit while we're talking. And then I'll click it away. But you can find it in the comments section. So click on it. And then you can check out where you can find the book, the courses I saw, um, good stuff all about, insights about and Michael as well. So go check that out. Before we start going into your origin story, Michael, I have a question. Go for it. Because I saw you're all about rediscovering your masculinity. I'm very interested in that. And I was wondering Absolutely. what would be the first step a guy must take to rediscover his masculinity? Mm, good question. So the first step somebody would take is to get really, really in touch and clear on what his core values are. And they are really the, the things that he, the non-negotiables. So the things that he uh, wants in his life that he just will not compromise on in any way, shape or form. For most men, that's family um, and then a sense of purpose as well. So as, as, long, as long as they've got family and a sense of purpose, most men uh, can operate from those core values and mm. they can find a life of, of meaning, meaningful fulfillment from that place. And, and then they can start to really discover what it means to be a man in this day and age. Um, and also, you know, in the, in the words of my book, rediscover their masculinity. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yep. Definitely got to check that out. That's why, again, I'm going to repeat people. That's why the website's here. That's why the website is in the comment section. So you can click on it and check out the book immediately and find some extra information. Um, I've done, I've done a little bit of my homework. So, um, <laughs> And that, that, that's absolutely great. And, and I'm glad you mentioned sense of purpose because the more and more I'm on this journey of becoming a fearless father, the more and more I realize, you know, what my purpose is, how important it is to mm. be. We're going to talk about more in depth about purpose in a minute because it's very absolutely. important. Absolutely. It is and, indeed. And yep. It should be very important to other men as well, right? So mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about that. But as promised, uh, Michael, before we go any further, um, share us your origin story and um, as well, which gives a, a bit of more perspective, share with us your your family, um, I say setup, structure, whatever you want to call it, but, you know, how, how your family looks like. Yeah, cool. Okay, cool. No worries. So um, family at the moment. So I'm, I'm married with a little two-year-old uh, and she was, a, she was a pleasant surprise. And, uh, and I have a 21-year-old son and a 17-year-old daughter from a previous relationship which uh, which ended in, in divorce around about 12, maybe 13, 13 years ago now. And so that really is the beginning of my, I think that divorce was really the beginning of my origin story, which really set me on the path to becoming the person that I am now, the man that I am now, mm. that is, you know, a men's mentor and relationship coach and now an author. And so... That was quite a difficult, as it is for many men that go through divorce and separation with children, it is just an absolutely, it's a real, like it's just a challenging process uh, full of adversity and struggle and pain and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And so if you've gone through that as a, as, a, as a man, it really, it will do one of two things. It will either break you or it will mm -hmm. absolutely, or it will absolutely uh, forge you if, if I can use that terminology, into, mm -hmm. into a better quality man. And so that's where my, really my origin story starts from when that divorce actually happened. And then f as a result of that, uh, things didn't go too well. And I wasn't able to see my children for a, for a period of time, wow. uh, probably around about 18 months or so. And I went through a lot of the struggle and pain that uh, a lot of men do a lot of dads do, a lot of fathers do in that situation. And I went through all of this period of self-doubt and am I a good father? Am I really 
a good example for my son mm -hmm. um, and my daughter as well. And, and all of this self-doubt started coming in. And then when that started happening, I fell into depression and then I couldn't hold down a job. And so there were financial issues mm -hmm. and there were family court issues and there was child support issues. And it just one thing piled upon another until one day or one morning, uh, I experienced some, some quite serious suicidal thoughts and that was around about suicidal tendencies. That was around about, uh, say, 11 years ago. Mm. And, and yeah, I think that was, that was really the lowest point in my life. And from then, I actually made a, made a choice because then I was in that, period, I was in that space and I received a, a text message from my son who I hadn't seen for quite a number of months and he was 11 at that point. Mm. And he said to me via text, uh, he said to me, Dad, we're really missing you and, and I love you and I can't wait to see you again. And then I, and that was really my emotional impact and that was my turning point. And it was at that point that I realized the man that I had chosen to become who had engaged in feelings of pain and struggle and anxiety and depression mm -hmm. and to, to have gotten to this low point is not the man and not the father that I wanted to show up for my children when I did get to see them again. And so it was at that point, that was the turning point that set me on this path. I was already a counsellor, um, but, that's, but that's really the point that set me onto the path that I'm on now, which was this journey of rediscovering what it means to be a man and how I should be showing up as a father and who I want to be in the world. And then I just started to become somebody different from that point on. And I haven't stopped that journey and that journey just continues. And I think it, it continues for all of us on an ongoing basis. Uh, and it's that journey of self-discovery, that, that process of forging the man and to really, to really become the person that will be a good quality father, a good quality man, one with purpose and that can contribute to society, a person with integrity and strength um, and courage and all that sort of stuff, right? So, so this, is, this is the journey of, of self-actualization and self-awareness mm -hmm. and self-discovery. And it's that internal journey that we all need to take in order to become the person that we actually envision and that we would like to become for ourselves and for our family um, and for our communities too. Absolutely. Mm. Wow, it's been some journey so far, uh, Michael. It certainly has. Yeah, yeah. I, I really appreciate that. Um, just, just um, how is because I, I had I had friends that um, divorced, and then they still haven't seen their kids, right? So they're still waiting for the kids to turn eighteen to actually be able to see them, because then the kids can wow. make them on their own. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So hard. I'm just wondering. What's your situation set up right now? Can you see them like every other weekend or how is that coordinated? It's well, other fathers get some hope. And, and I've noticed in the U.S. actually some fathers won custody uh, as well, which is awesome, right? <laughs> That's where yeah, we go. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, man. And, and it's good because I'm starting to see the tide changing a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to see the tide turning a little bit where there's also – because it's actually called something when – one parent uh, stops or prevents the other parent from seeing the children. It's actually called parental alienation. So there's wow. an actual term, there's actually a, a terminology for it now. And one of the things that I've noticed here in Australia and also in the US a little bit, where I'm starting to see some, some change within that sort of field where people are starting to understand that one parent actually does intentionally alienate children from the other parent for reasons that are malicious and not with any real basis of fact. It's just resentment and bitterness and hate, and that's mm. why they stop the other parent from seeing children. And so what I'm noticing in the legal system, in the family court system here in Australia, is that there's, we're starting to see some movement in that there's, there's starting to be some talk about when there are court orders in place for for parents to see children, if those court orders are broken, uh, then there are criminal consequences for the person mm -hmm. that breaks the, the, uh, the court order. And if there's evidence of parental alienation, then that person can actually be charged and convicted with, the, with a crime, wow. which is essentially 
very similar to child abuse. This is not in legislation now, but there's definitely some moves towards yeah. that, which is very encouraging. And hopefully it will, it will uh, dissuade people from, from doing the things that, you know, my ex-wife did to prevent me from seeing my children, but men do this too, right? So mm -hmm. uh, it, unfortunately, it's mainly, it's mainly women. And the, the reason why it's mainly women that alienate children from the fathers is because of the fact that most of the time it is the mothers that, that have full custody or they get majority custody of the children. And so if anyone's going to be alienated, it's usually the man, or usually the father. And, um, and yeah, so, but, but it's positive news that I'm starting to see some really good movement in yep. the family court system to change how we manage uh, how children see parents. Yeah, And so, yeah, so, yeah, now I look, I have a great relationship with my 21-year-old son now, which is fantastic. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, but he's moved out of home. He moved out of home about three years ago. So mm -hmm. when he wasn't in amongst that influence anymore, he was free to make his own choices and he made a good choice. <laughs> and, uh, and my daughter now, who's 17, her and I are, let's say, we are beginning to, beginning to create a better relationship again. Mm -hmm. Nice. I'm glad Which, to hear that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But look, it, wasn't, it hasn't been easy. Mm -hmm. and there's been some adversity and it's just a matter of what I found works and for those guys out there that are going through this sort of stuff, what I found really works for your own for your own benefit and also for the benefit of your children is to always let them know that they're loved and mm -hmm. that you are looking forward to seeing them and that you think about them all the time and that you, yes, you wish the situation was different but you're looking forward to spending more time with them in the future and you hope but that future point will come very, very soon. Uh, and as in as many ways as you can possibly do that, by text, by email, phone calls, whatever it is that you can do, however, whatever contact you can have, that's the best way to do it. And I did that with my children and they still remember that. Nice. Yeah. They said no matter what was, yeah, they said, and even my son said, no matter what was going on, Dad, we always knew that you mm -hmm. loved us and you were there and you were thinking about us and missing us. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah, the message gets through and eventually when they do, when they are old enough to make their own choices or at least they're old enough to push back a little bit, uh, they make some good choices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. That's great advice. I appreciate you sharing that and talking so openly about it because, yeah, as you mentioned, it's hard, right? It's difficult. I don't it know. Is. I have no idea. Uh, Still happily married <laughs> with my kids. Oh, well, I'm happy for that's yeah. great, and and the oh, that's all the better for your children. Mm, no, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm starting to notice that um, where there are situations that happens, this happens. It should be a case where every case is different, because there are cases that the mother shouldn't be with the children, right, alone for whatever reason, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, abusing the kids, whatever it is, right mentally or physically, but the same goes the other way, right? Yep. It's no longer as black and white as it used to be where it's like, okay, divorce kids with the mothers, dads paying, and then hopefully they get to see the kids, right? So it's great to see that change, and I appreciate you sharing about that. So um, one of the things that you mentioned that's the first step is family, of course, and second, sense of purpose, right? Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Now that we know the first step, of course, the next is like, okay, yeah, I got to focus on family, I got to focus on purpose. How does one find, or what, what, is, what is it that you're teaching to um, your clients on how they can find their sense of purpose? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> bit of a, it's a bit of a process, but definitely mm -hmm. the way that you find a sense of purpose is by getting in touch with those core values. So your core values could be things like, health and well-being, that could be family, that could be financial stability, it could be a number of different things. There's usually mm -hmm. two or three key areas that men will list as their core values and the stuff, the things that are really important to them and that they, that is actually valuable to them and something worthy of achieving and not just, you know, this version of success that we all think is out there, but... Um, it's more about these important things that men actually value. And so once you understand what those core values are and you get in touch with that thing or couple of things 
you might you might know you might have have felt this before class mm. and that is that thing that you can do where you can just sit there and you can actually do this thing or engage in this particular activity and then all of a sudden you've forgotten to eat and you've forgotten to drink and time has gone by and passed and all of a sudden it's four or five hours down the track and you're like wow where did that time go and that's what is called flow okay so when we get into a state of flow uh, that's usually tied with some things surrounding our passion something that we can just do and time goes by without us realizing mm. and we forget to eat and we forget to sleep and we forget to do all these things that normally come naturally because we're in the zone and that's usually our zone of genius and when we find that zone of genius and then we tie that in with our core values we usually find in there somewhere is a sense of purpose and that's where we find that thing that really gets our juices flowing and then once we find what gets our juices flowing that's our purpose or that's what we feel our purpose is at least at this stage in our life uh, what happens then is that we can then start to think about well okay cool how can I make a living out of this and how can I contribute to my family and society and my community and possibly the world at a very, very high level whilst mm. engaging in this thing that gives me such pleasure and and time just passes without me really even realising. And that's where we find a sense of fulfilment and that's where we connect our core values with our purpose and then we can contribute to whatever it is that we want to contribute to in the world mm. and however we do that. And, mm. I th and, and for men, it's so important. Like it's just... Every, every man that I've ever coached or mentored over the years and every man that I've interviewed for my book, every single one of them says, if I don't have some kind of purpose or direction in life, I just feel lost and I feel empty and I feel like I'm just living day to day and just going about my day without really understanding why and I have no direction and no purpose and I really, you know, without that, I feel a bit empty and I don't feel fulfilled and I don't feel happy. Bless you. No, thanks. <laughs> Sorry about that. My throat. And the first one, I, I hit the mute button. This time I was a little too late. Apologies. All good. Um, yeah, I, I, I got to agree with that. Absolutely. One of the things that I noticed is that if I haven't focused one day on working, you know, according to my purpose, and by the time I go to bed, I'm like, man, this was a shitty day. <laughs> yeah, you don't feel like you achieved anything and there's no fulfillment in that, is there? Yep. So imagine doing that every single day mm -hmm. for, for a week and then every single day for a month and then every single day for a year and then all of a sudden you look back on the last five years and you go, where did that go yep. and what did I actually achieve? And if I look back on that five years, what happened? What's different? Mm -hmm. And so this is what I always say to people when I talk to them when, I, when, I, when I'm coaching them. Look back, like look back a year or two years or three or five years. Has anything changed? And if the answer really at its core is no, then that means you're not moving forward and you're not growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. That simple, but that <laughs> it is that, that simple. It is that yeah, simple. yeah, exactly. Yeah. We try to make it so hard for ourselves sometimes as well, right? <laughs> yeah, we do. Every we all overcomplicate stuff, but it's really simple. If yeah. you want to know, if you want to know where things are lacking in life or where you feel that. You're not getting the results that you want. Look at the results. Look at the outcomes you're getting. Look at the results. Look at your financial situation. Look at your relationship. Look at your career. Look at all these things that are important to you and then you'll figure out pretty quickly where you're living with purpose and where mm -hmm. you have direction and where you're not because your results will, be, will not be in alignment with what you truly desire. Absolutely. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. I really appreciate that. Cool, man. Uh, one of the things that really, or at least I saw the words that you got on your Facebook and, and the words really connected with me, it's been a journey for me in this case, and I want to talk about it. You, you put down 100% uh, ultimate responsibility, right? Yeah. And I was saying the only one you can control is yourself, mm -hmm. right? And that's it. <laughs> that's right. Everybody, yep. everybody else is. <clears throat> that journey, as I say, it was a journey. <laughs> it's not like, okay, I can only control myself and that's it, right? It's not just all of a sudden you say, wow, this resonates with me, 100% ultimate responsibility. Yes. Yep. You yep. go through my 
So can you talk a little bit about, you know, what's the mind shift, right? That people have to start taking to get to that hundred. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. And the reason mm -hmm. why it's a difficult thing to do to always take 100% ultimate responsibility for everything. Um, and just so that people know, that is one of the seven standards of men that I talk about in the book, which is one of the seven standards that, every, that I believe every man should embody mm -hmm. to, uh, to really rediscover his masculinity and, and, and live a life of purpose. So one of them is taking 100% ultimate responsibility for everything, everything, literally everything. And so what happens there is, A, that's incredibly hard to do because we're being conditioned our whole lives to actually not take responsibility, to blame everything and everyone that we possibly can mm -hmm. because if we take responsibility, that means it's our fault. And if it's our fault, then we've done something wrong. And for a man, that really challenges our ego. Yeah. And, so, and so that is one of the most challenging things to do, to actually take 100% responsibility for everything however when we when we start to think about how do i how can i do that that feels like it's a good thing and not me just blaming myself for everything that goes wrong and this is a question that i get a lot and a way to really reframe all of that in your own mind is to start connecting a sense of empowerment with responsibility so and i'll explain that a little bit more so when you, when you don't take responsibility, when you blame somebody else, what you're doing is you effectively you're saying, not only are you to blame for my problem, the thing that I've created that is undesirable in my life, not only are you to blame for that, but I'm saying that because you're at fault, then I can't change it in any way because you're the one that created it, so you must be the one that has to fix it. And so what, that's very disempowering. When you think about that in that context, that's actually quite disempowering. It takes away any sense of, well, I have, I have control over my life and I can create my outcomes and I can change my results if I want to. What we're doing is we're putting all of that responsibility onto others and we're putting the, and we're taking, we're taking, we're not taking responsibility for ourselves, which means we're not empowering ourselves to make change. When we take responsibility, what we do is we send a very clear message to the subconscious to say, well, whilst this is not necessarily our fault, or maybe it is, ultimately we're going to take responsibility for this so then we can empower ourselves to change. Mm -hmm. And when you empower yourself to change, you understand that you have control over the outcome. And another great part about taking 100% ultimate responsibility is that when we do that, we are very, very unlikely to repeat the same mistake again. Mm -hmm. And so not only do we empower ourselves by taking responsibility, uh, we also accept the consequences of our mistakes. And that being the case, we're very unlikely to make them again. When we take ownership, that's responsibility. And when we take responsibility, there's no blame and there's no fault. Mm -hmm. Yep, I like that. Thanks for sharing that. That's that's absolutely powerful, and and it frees you up all of a sudden. Like I've noticed that. Like I know it's easy. Like something happens, and like it's the government's fault. I mean, yeah. sure, it always is, right? But <laughs> still, let's, it's like, let's just look, we'll just blame the economy. That's easy. Oh yeah, that one. Yeah, that one's even easier. It's the economy. But as soon as you start thinking to yourself, and I think all the successful people, right, even in a bad economy. That's exactly what they're doing. They don't look at the economy. They look like, okay, what is my responsibility? What can I do instead of looking yeah. at like how can I change my results? How yeah. can I change my results? And also, when you take one hundred percent ultimate responsibility, you're assigning a sense of duty as well, and that's a big thing. So when we have, when we feel like we have a sense of duty to something, it's all of a sudden we're responsible for something. And in this case, we have a duty to be responsible for our own results. And we mm -hmm. have a duty to lead the people that we love and to support the people that we love. Mm -hmm. And that's all about taking responsibility too because when we have kids and we have a partner and we have people that we are responsible for, if we're not taking responsibility, then who is going to lead those people and who is going to be responsible for them and who's going to lead them in, in a positive and empowered way? Mm -hmm. Who's going to do that? Exactly.
who else but you, right? Or who, who else, else but us? Right? <laughs> who else but who else but us? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. I appreciate that. That's great, great advice. And I, I hope, man, I keep forgetting to tell people, but I hope people are writing, taking some notes. I, I always, <clears throat> um, I think, I think I'm, I'm in a big advantage over everybody else because I, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I get to ask the questions because I'm a little selfish. Sometimes I put questions in there that are really important for me to know, and this was one of them. As I mentioned, cool. what I'm struggling with the most is not if something happens to say like, okay, yeah, that's my responsibility. It's more the the response of somebody else towards what I have done, right? So right. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. Of course, now nothing comes in, but it's just like you do something, you post something which you think is of high value, and somebody responds in a way that you're like, Wow, that's really negative, right? And then mm-hmm. that is why I also have to take the responsibility. Like I can't control what that person puts, what that person writes, but I have to take the responsibility of what that means for me. That's correct. Still, correct. That's correct. still the part where I'm struggling. And that's where self-belief comes in. So if you're if you feel a sense of conviction with whatever it is that you posted and you've done that with a loving intention and without the intention to hurt or harm anyone, mm-hmm. then what you're doing is you're essentially speaking from your truth and mm-hmm. there's nothing wrong with speaking from your truth. And if somebody else has an issue with that and they want to challenge it, that's okay because they're coming from their truth mm-hmm. and they need to take responsibility for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, it's always, and it's always a reflection, more of a reflection on the other person and where they are and their own state Mm-hmm. Than, than what it is that you posted because let's be honest uh you know the stuff that we post on social media can be taken a million different ways by a million different people sure. and it's very it's very difficult to it's it's really well not just difficult but impossible to cater for everybody's sensibilities mm-hmm. yeah yeah no, absolutely. Mm. What I try to know what I do though is every single thing that I post is always positive. But then again, yeah, you're right. It's from my point of view. So, yeah, that's, that's right. great. Your perspective. Great your perspective. Yeah, your beliefs, your values. It comes. It all comes from yeah. you. Mm-hmm. And so there will be people that will disagree and there will be people that will challenge you because their beliefs and values and their state is different in that moment. Yep. Whereas, whereas tomorrow or next week, if you posted the same thing, that person might respond differently depending mm-hmm. upon their state in that, in that moment. Awesome. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. Yeah. And also on their experiences, because what I've noticed, I posted last time, what was it? Uh, amazing kids come from amazing dads or something like that. And somebody responded like, yeah. yeah, that's not true. And because he had a complete different experience because of clients that he was teaching, they were amazing yeah. kids. However, their fathers were not so much. <laughs> right? So it's yeah. like, yep, yep, yep. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, great. Different perspectives, different yeah. perspectives from, from, different, from different realities. Exactly. But it yeah. makes it interesting. So great. I really appreciate that insight. Um, you mentioned there are seven stands of men, um, 100% responsibility being one. Uh, yep. Would you mind sharing the other six, which makes us then get to seven? Absolutely. So there's compassion, uh, purpose, self actualization, courage, strength, and integrity. So mm-hmm. they're the other six. As, and the seventh is 100% ultimate responsibility. And these are. These are effectively the seven standards of men and what I believe, not what I believe, but based on my experience and based on the men that I've coached and the way that we see men showing up in society, if men practiced these and embodied these seven standards of men at a higher level in their own lives on a day-to-day basis, we would actually see better quality men walking around who are bringing up more balanced and better quality boys as well and who are better examples for their daughters because we've got to remember something right so boys will always try to try to emulate their fathers their fathers are their heroes they're their superheroes they are also the biggest influence in a boy's life and a boy will always try to emulate his father and always try to become his father and so he will grow up and he will he will essentially take on all of the attributes and all the virtues of his father, whether they're good ones or not so good ones, Mm -hmm. because that's how he learns. And and we learn by experience. 
And the same goes with our daughters. Our daughters will always, will always internalize how she should be treated by a man based on how a man treats her mother, based mm -hmm. on how her father treats her mother, for instance, or the woman in his life. And so she will then attract or she will then tolerate a man in her life at that level mm -hmm. as opposed to a higher level what th that she probably does deserve. And so when we start to embody these seven standards of men, we start to understand that not only do we bring a better version of ourselves to the world, we also, um, we also set a much better example for our children, mm -hmm. for boys to, to emulate this better quality man that they can bring into the world as themselves, as they grow into teenage years and young adulthood. And for girls, it's about, well, you know, because they say that for little girls, their father is their first love. And that, and that, and that when they get older and they, they will always look for someone who is very, very similar to their father mm -hmm. in, so, in, in, in some aspects, especially the way that they treat it and the way that they, the way that they observe their father treating their mother. And so, it's so important for us men to step into a very highly virtuous state that we can that we can bring forth into life and into the world and into our community in such a way that demonstrates that we are living at a very high level mm. as much as we possibly can. Nice. I like that. It, it reminded me when you said, you know, a, a dad is a daughter first love. It reminded me immediately of one of the posts that I saw in one of the dad groups that I'm in. And it was a father with her daughter and he took her on a date. And he said, yeah, yeah. Yeah. he's like, I'm taking my daughter on dates to show her exactly how her future boyfriends or, you know, husbands should treat her. That, and I was like, that's right. I've seen this video oh. and, and he brought her flowers at the front door. He opened the car door for her as well. Nice. Um, yeah, all this sort of stuff, right? He pulled the chair out at the restaurant and let her sit down and then he ordered for her, not ordered for her, but but her food came first and he waited for, for all of that before he started eating. And all of these things, all of these virtuous, chivalrous things that we used to be able to do or we used to do naturally mm -hmm. seem, seem very forced now for some men. Mm. And I won't get too much into this, but we're also finding that women don't necessarily want to allow us to do these virtuous chivalrous things either uh for different reasons so but i think there's there's that chivalry is definitely missing in a lot of men mm -hmm. these days mm. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yep time to step of our game i got two boys so i can only show them how to treat other women by you know what i do with with my wife absolutely um, by your example absolutely yeah. Yeah, lots of responsibilities, but I love it. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? Because you can see them develop as time goes on and you can see them starting to embody and emulate some of the really cool stuff that you do. Mm -hmm. And then you go, "That's I'm proud of you. That's that, yeah, that's my son. See, that's my son did that. That's because he saw me do it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I love the fact that my it was my oldest son's birthday last Thursday. He turned six. And we had a <laughs> birthday party and they had... Uh, his friends sitting next to him, so two friends sitting next to him, and then he was in the middle, and then all two would give him a gift. And it didn't matter if it was a boy or a girl. The lady was there. He told them to give a high five. However, he would give them a kiss yep. and a hug as well, right? Oh, that's cute. You, you appreciate yeah. it. And I was like, man, that is so powerful. And then even when some of the kids ran away because they didn't want that because they're not used to that kind of affection, right? I only had to look at him and say, do you do you. Right? Don't look at them. You do what you feel is right. And then he did it again. Yep. And I heard all the yeah, parents on him. saying, oh, I'm like, probably, probably that moment again. <laughs> <laughs> right? But it's awesome. Got to fill up the ego a little bit as well, right? Knowing that we Absolutely. Do there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. As in, in healthy ways, there's nothing wrong with that. Exactly, exactly. So let me ask you this because, as you mentioned, right, it's a journey. And Absolutely, yep. Sometimes I have the feeling that so many of us, we, we place our goals and that's all we focus on, right? So I'm just wondering from your perspective, what's your view on goals versus journey? Goals versus, well, one's very, one's very focused on the result 
Mm. And one's very focused on what you get on the way to trying to achieve the result mm -hmm. and the learnings and the growth along the way. So the journey, really, when we focus on the journey, what we're focusing mm -hmm. on is we're focusing on the growth and the learning and the awarenesses and becoming a better person at every stage of that journey along that path. And when we're focused specifically on an objective or a goal, we're focused specifically only on that. And I think we lose... I think we lose the lessons and the blessings and the and the growth and the learnings along the way because we're so focused on the objective. Mm -hmm. And there's, I, I talk about this in the book as well, and I talk about the allegory of a mountain and how men are so focused. A lot of men are so focused on achieving success that they they lose everything along the way that they truly value mm -hmm. because they're so focused on this. You know, and I use the allegory of a mountain. So I say that, you know, I'll, I'll ad lib a little bit here um, because I'm not going to read straight from the book, but I can if you want me to. I can read this passage from the book if you want me to. And but um, would you like me to do that? If you think it's valuable, absolutely. I love that. I think, it's, I think it's valuable. So let me just find yeah. it. Let me just, let me just, in fact, I've got a book here. Just one second. Yeah. We always like these kind of unique moments where go. You get okay, the here we go. Here we go. I've got it. Let's see if I can find it. So I think it's on page 40. Let's have a look. No, it could be a little bit more. Let's see if I can find it. It is all about, it is all about climbing what I call Mount Success. And along the way, maybe it'll be better if I search the PDF. Oh, quickly again. Dun, 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 dun. Sure, we got Not long. <laughs> um, just for the people that are joining us now, um, this is Michael's website. You can find also um, the link to the book, right? To, to buy the book. And he, while he is looking right now for the passage that he's going to share with us, which I always find really special when the author actually, you know, reads a little bit on his book. Is it an audio as well? It's not. It's not yet. No, it's not. I'm working on that. I'll nice. be working on the audio version at some point over the next few months. Awesome. I can't find it. You'd think I'd be able to put my put my finger on this straight away, wouldn't you? Anyway, while I'm looking for it, it's all about climbing Mount Success. And what we do is when a man is so focused on climbing towards this undefined, mostly undefined version of success that he's decided that he wants to attain, what happens is that he climbs the mountain Mount Success with one hand and he makes his way up Mount Success with one hand and with the other hand he is holding everything that he truly values and I'm talking about this while I'm looking for it in the book uh -huh. and then it's and then at some point at some point up Mount Success when he realizes that one hand just isn't enough anymore and he needs two hands in order to climb Mount Success and get to the summit and achieve this version of success that is, as I was saying before, entirely undefined. Mm -hmm. What happens is he then he, he then needs, but I found it. Oh, he then yeah. needs both hands to. Yeah, there it is. He needs both hands to climb the mountain, mm -hmm. and so what he does is he lets go of everything that he truly values, which is usually his family, mm -hmm. his partner, and those mm -hmm. relationships. And then he uses both hands to climb Mount Success. And then for the, for the person that actually gets there, what he finds is then he looks, he looks around and the allegory is the mountain. But then in real life, we're talking about, you know, he's, he's very proud of the Hugo Boss suit that he's wearing. He's driving the expensive European car. He lives in a penthouse suite. He has a fat wallet. But then he's wife and his children don't want to have a lot to do with him because along the way the journey of you know 
striving for success, he's actually let go of everything that he truly values, which is his family and his sense of fulfillment. And he gets there and he realizes that all of it is actually meaningless without that which he values. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. And so, yeah. And so I wish I could have found this earlier, but um, I think I kind of found it here. I can read it if you like, but um, there's another there's another little story that I write about in the book and it's actually in, I'll read this, it's in Khaled Hosseini's book, The Kite Runner, and I'll read this quickly. Mm-hmm. That same night I wrote my first short story. It took me 30 minutes. It was a dark little tale about a man who found a magic cup and learning that if he wept into the cup, his tears turned into pearls. But even though he had always been poor, he was a happy man and rarely shed a tear. So he always found ways to make himself so he found ways to make himself sad so that his tears could make him rich. As the pearls piled up, so did his greed grow. The story ended with the man sitting on a mountain of pearls, knife in hand, weeping helplessly into the cup with his beloved wife's slain body in his arms. And I, I write about, I, I actually quote that in the book just before I talk about Mount Success. Mm-hmm. And, and what I find is that <clears throat> so many men go on this journey of achieving this, you know, undefined version of success. And we don't know really what success is. It's different for every person, for every man. Mm-hmm. But what it usually is, it's usually the quest for material and, uh, material and financial wealth and some kind, some kind of societal status, which says that we're up here and everybody else is down here. Mm. And that's what we usually strive for. That's what men usually strive for. But unfortunately, we lose sight of the reason why we start striving for it in the first place, which is to provide for our family. Um, that's usually the reason why. And a lot along the way, as we start to achieve higher and higher levels of success and we're almost there, we stop doing it for the reason that we started out doing it for, and then it becomes about achieving the achieving, you know, getting to the apex, getting to the summit of Mount Success. Mm-hmm. And so then, yeah, it's it's actually tragic because a lot of men do this, and a lot of men get to that thing called success, and they get there and they wonder why they're still not feeling fulfilled and they're still not happy, mm-hmm. and that's because, as I've said a couple of times, they sacrifice along the way everything they value. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I really appreciate you reading that and sharing uh, the insights on that book. It's very em- empowering for, for others to understand that and yeah, start taking action there or reflecting at least on, hey, what does my life look like right now, right? Um, yeah, and, and reflecting on why you're doing what you're doing. And this is where a sense of purpose comes in yeah. and, and really being very, very conscious of why do you do what you do, being very intentional about how you do it and why you do it and for what purpose. I mean, I know over the last few years, I've asked myself this question so many times. Every time I'm doing something, for what purpose do you do that? For what Mm -hmm. purpose are you thinking that way? For what purpose are you making this decision? For what purpose? And when you can attach some purpose to whatever it is that you're doing, the decision you're making, the thoughts you're you're thinking, the feelings you're feeling, and you can attach a sense of purpose to it, then you are living life much more intentionally. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, switching a little bit to topic, since uh, time is flying, <laughs> we're having a good time. Um, and I also want to focus on what you also teach, um, you know, relationship coach. Um, what are some of the biggest mistakes men make when it comes to um, their relationship with their wife? Biggest mistakes. One of the biggest mistakes that men will make is exactly what I've been talking about, and that is not truly being in touch with their core values and what they actually what they actually value. Mm-hmm. And then what they do is along the way they will tell themselves, well, I have to do this because I'm providing for my family mm-hmm. or I have to do this because if I don't, what's my wife going to think of me if I don't earn this kind of money, if I don't if she can't afford to go on this holiday or we can't, she can't drive the car that she wants or whatever the case may be. And so what we do is we start to attach a sense of meaning to the material things in life, thinking 
that that's going to make our wives happy. That's going to make mm -hmm. our partner happy. When in fact, what women actually want is they do, they do want a man with a sense of direction and a sense of purpose and, but also that can be present and that can be very compassionate and embody some of the, as the attributes that I talked about before. Mm -hmm. And so the biggest mistake that men make is to take the focus off who, who they were when their wife fell in love with them and try to become somebody different in an attempt to please her when in fact they've already pleased her and she's already there and she will stay as long as you remain present within the relationship. Mm -hmm. Nice. I like that. And is that then immediately the, um, the key to a growing and successful relationship or are there more advices that you can share of what men can do to, um, well, in my case, for example, I'm really focused on creating a, a deep emotional connection with my wife. So I'm sure every mm. man and, and every husband out there has their own different goal of how they see their marriage, but that for me is really important, right? So are there any uh, keys to success, <laughs> if we can use the word success, in a relationship such a relationship yeah yeah conscious conscious but being very conscious and intentional in relationships is the thing that challenges most people because what happens is when two people get together they always put their best foot forward so when they first start dating and they meet and they're in that honeymoon phase everybody always puts their best foot forward mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. but but then what happens over time is when we start to get comfortable, that foot comes back a little bit and mm. we start to become complacent and we start to take things for granted and we don't say, I love you anymore because, well, she should know that I love her. Look, mm. I'm here and I'm working hard and I'm providing for the family. She should just know. And then, and then over time, we forget to do the little things that were so endearing and that she fell in love with in the first place. And those things are really about contributing and being conscious at a higher level within the relationship, being attentive as well. And, and, and you're right, what you said before, maintaining, creating and, and maintaining a very deep level of connection between the two of you. And that's not just for the, none of this is just for the man to do. It requires both people in the relationship to be conscious and to, and to create together, to co-create a very conscious, intentional and purposeful relationship. And you do that by doing all the things for each other and with each other that were endearing and attractive and desirable at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's actually as simple as that. And like we were saying before, we complicate stuff, but it's really not that complicated. As long as we remain as intentional as what we were and present as what we were at the beginning of the relationship, then the rest of the relationship will continue to be perhaps not as not like it was in the honeymoon period but you remain more consciously connected mm -hmm. and so that means that you can overcome adversity a lot better between the two of you mm -hmm. you can have you will automatically communicate at a higher level um, sex is going to be a lot more fulfilling mm -hmm. you will actually want to spend time with each other and do things together and you find things to talk about and things flow uh, it's only when we lose those that connection and when we stop being consciously present within the relationship that we lose all of that and that's when things start to go wrong. Mm -hmm. And so the people that come to me for relationship coaching, I, I hear one of these two things all the time. Michael, this is our last ditch effort. If this doesn't work, I don't know what's going to, I don't know what's going to happen. And the other thing is we've just, I feel like we've just fallen out of love with, with each other. So People don't necessarily fall out of love. They stop being conscious within relationships. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what happens. And when you stop being conscious and you stop contributing at a higher level to a relationship, eventually things are just going to dissipate and fall apart. Mm -hmm. And that will be the same for any relationship. And so when they say relationships require work, I wouldn't call it work. I would call it intentional consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, we I made the mistake of calling some stuff work. Well, it shouldn't be called work. Because work in yeah. the end has a negative um, 
yeah, just a negative. It has a bit word. of a negative, yeah, a bit of a negative connotation. It's like, uh, you know, work implies that we have to put some kind of, uh, you know, mammoth effort into something, and we're doing so unwillingly and out of obligation. Uh, whereas in a relationship, we should want to do it willingly uh, because we want to. And because we're investing more into our relationship and our partner and our future and the person we love and our family and mm -hmm. everything. So there's actually quite a big investment here when it comes to relationships. And I don't think people, people don't realise how big the investment is until the investment starts to lose money. And when the investment isn't quite as valuable as what it was before to them, mm -hmm. and when they start to realise that uh, things are not as good as what they were, that's when all of a sudden the enormity of what they're starting to lose comes to their conscious awareness. And that's when people, are, unfortunately, that's when people are motivated to make changes and to come and see someone like me. And what, I've, what I always tell people whenever I get the opportunity and I talk about relationships is that you're better off seeing someone like me when things are actually okay and mm -hmm. you just want to make them better and create more permanence in what you're experiencing in a relationship now, rather than coming to me from the depths of hell, and I've got to reach down and you know drag you out <laughs> and try to help you to find the path back to heaven again. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's 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 actually curious to well for me it's curious to find out okay why is it that nobody moves beforehand when then your energy that you have to put in is going to be less drastic. Yeah. All of a sudden, when it's like you know, all hell is breaking loose, and we're on that on the on the cliff, hanging yeah. on for dear life, right? So, yep, 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 yep. Yeah, look, I always find that the, the the pain of the pain of staying the same has to be worse than the pain of change before people will actually be motivated to do anything, and that's unfortunate, but that's human nature. We don't want to admit that there's such a massive problem in this thing that we value so much. And if we lose it, our whole world will feel like it's crumbling around us. People mm -hmm. don't want to acknowledge that until it starts crumbling. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they can't put the pieces back together again and they don't know how to do it. And then they have to reach out to someone because they start to realise, wow, like this is actually really valuable to me and I don't want to lose it. And how do we get to this point? I hear that so much. How do we get to this point? You got to this point because you slipped into unconsciousness within your relationship. You stopped being present. Yep. You stopped doing all the things that were desirable and attractive. You just stopped doing them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep. And do a lot of, and I don't think it matters with just women or, or men, do they hide behind their kids saying like, yeah, but it's different now we have kids? I'm just wondering because I hear that yeah. a lot. Look, I, I've used, I've, oh, look, to be honest, I've used that excuse sometimes. Okay. I've gone, yeah, it's different. It's different because I have kids. It's actually not. Um, I think we like to use kids as an excuse for remaining. I think we like to use kids as an excuse for laziness, honestly. Mm. That's, what, that's what I think we like to do. I think it's easy because it's easy and people go, oh, yes, you must be tired having a, having a child or children. And yes, we understand it's not the same and, you know, you've got to find little tiny periods of time, little pockets of time to have sex and you've got to have, and by the time the kids go to bed at night, um, you know, you're just exhausted and to actually sit down on the couch and engage in conversation with a glass of wine and a cheese platter, that's all just too much effort. And date nights, what are you talking about? Now we have to organise a babysitter and we're going to do this stuff in advance. You've got to be kidding me. And so... Um, and I think so. I think I think we use kids as an excuse for laziness. I think we ex use kids as an excuse because we can't be bothered. Uh -huh. yeah. But then, but then it's funny how when the, when the couple is then in front of me and we're talking about the things that they used to do, which nurtured their relationship. It's funny then how all of a sudden they can be bothered, and it's not that much of an effort to mm. organise a babysitter and book a restaurant and do all this sort of stuff and they, it, they're motivated to do it then. But I wish people would be motivated to do it before the relationship is mm. crumbling. Yeah. And that's yeah. my objective. At some point in the future, I want to start to bring together couples who are happy but, mm. want, to, but want to make that happy permanent. Nice. Yeah. 
as opposed um, to the ones that are on the brink of destruction. Yeah. Yeah. I like yeah. that. I definitely like that. Yeah, it's uh, our journey has been fun. <laughs> I actually uh, remarried my wife when we were five years married. I took her, or we went to Colombia where <laughs> her dad lives, and I set up secretly another uh, w wedding ceremony. Oh, that's which cool. Yeah. Help. Yeah. Yeah. Until what was it? Last Sunday we were talking. There were some people for, over from Colombia. At a friend's house, and we were talking, and we we're asking her, like, when was the last time that she that you went there? And she said, 2013, which was actually the time before that we went. Yeah. So like, Excuse me. And didn't you said, hey, you what? Years ago, and <laughs> and you know, she's like, oh yeah. I'm like, okay, great, oh. thanks. <laughs> but well, there, there's the doing that again, won't you? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I definitely. We almost we're. Yeah, two years away from ten years, so I'm I'm thinking already on. Oh, congratulations, back. congratulations! I hope you got something big planned for that. I appreciate it. Uh, still got two years, so I'm I'm molding it a little. You'll by figure something out, hey? Family's all over the place, so it makes it yep. uh, challenging. I'm not gonna say difficult, but challenging. So that's a lot of fun. Yeah. But now we're reaching to the end. What I wanted to ask you, um, besides your book, right? Um, you know, people should absolutely get your book, and I'll share the link in a little bit again to your website. Um. What would be some of the other books that you could recommend um, dadpreneurs, right? Fathers that are entrepreneurs at the same time that you think would be really valuable. It could be two or three, whatever you, whatever you like. I would recommend a book by Mark Manson called, uh, called, mm, just a second before I say that. Let me have a look at my bookshelf over here. So there's a book by Jack Donovan called The Way of Men. That's a very mm -hmm. good book. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I will recommend this one. There's a book by Mark Manson called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Ah, and, yeah. and he's just brought out another book, and I think it's called Everything's Fucked, I think. I haven't read it yet, but um, that's a blue one. So the first one's an orange one. This is a blue one. I haven't read the blue one yet, so I can't recommend it, but I can certainly recommend uh, the first one that I just mentioned. They're both good books. And The Art of Manliness, the, the Art of Manliness is a very good one too. So there's also The Alchemist. The Alchemist is a massive, that was an, a very influential book for me mm. uh, many years ago. What else can I recommend? Um, hmm. Just having a look at what, well, yeah, I reckon there, I reckon that's a good three or four that I can will keep uh, It will keep dads busy for a while. <laughs> Absolutely. And also I can't forget Forging Excalibur, Rediscover mm. Your Masculinity. And if people are interested, I just happen to have a copy right there. There you um, go. Yeah, love it. I appreciate that. It's available Great. on Amazon. And if you're in Australia, it's available on paperback from me. Ah. Dang it, we're now in Australia. <laughs> oh, I'm, sure we can, I'm sure we can organize something. I'm sure we can oh. organize something. Awesome, man. Love it. I'm going to share because um, we're at the last question and I'm going to share the link again. Um, for all of those dads out there that have been watching this either live on the recording or maybe they're listening to the podcast, which I'm going to try and get out there ASAP. If they have any other questions for you or if they just want to follow you, get in contact with you, um, mm -hmm. what's the best way besides your website? Uh, they can find me on Facebook. Um, okay. Just under my name, Michael Laurier, L-A-U-R-I-A. -A. Uh, and I'm on Instagram and I'm on LinkedIn. And, yeah, it's pretty easy to find me. If you put Michael Laurier in the search bar in Facebook, There'll be two pages and my profile that'll come up. So Michael Laurier, and there's also Michael Laurier, the conscious relationship coach, um, and my personal profile as well. Nice. Plus, nice. I also run a plus I also run a men's group called the Man Space. Man Space. Okay. Yeah. Man Space. Excellent. The Man Space. Yep. I got that written down because if you're watching the recording then or you're listening to the podcast, you can find all the links in the descriptions. <laughs> so yep, cool. like this, but I have no idea where they're gonna end up. <laughs> YouTube there and we'll just go like podcast somewhere over like there. That. 
There'll yeah. be something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So, uh, Michael, thank you so much for taking the time for being on. I really appreciate it. Uh, great thank insights. You. I love you sharing your experience as well. That, yeah, it, it always helps a lot with putting things in perspective and learning a lot from your successes, mistakes, and all that stuff. So that's fantastic. Um, all the people that have been with us, watching us live on the recording, whatever it is, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. I keep reminding it. If you find a golden nugget that resonates with you, take it out and start taking steps, whatever that step means. Take action and enjoy it. So talk to everyone later and have a fantastic day. Bye-bye. Are you still meeting up with your friends now that you're a father? Kids making you stress out. You got no time for yourself to work out, read, or relax. Can you still remember the time you were hanging out with your friends, feeling energetic, happy, and confident? Spending time together and talking about your life and your crazy dreams. You're feeling alone now, don't you? No one to share your challenges with, and you're just running around from one storm into the next. Well, it's time to change this now. Join me and the Brotherhood of Fearless Fathers to speak on a weekly basis with like-minded dads to crush your challenges, face your fears with determination, be held accountable, and regain control of your life. If you want to become the hero your family needs you to be, then go to becomeafearlessfather.com brotherhood. Looking forward to seeing you on one of our next calls.